already existing success of decolonization. Well, what it means to say this, uh, um, what does it mean to say that this assumption is wrong? And how can one proceed to study of the world of world politics after that? The decolonizing uh, element of this question calls for more, ha uh, however. Specifically, it calls for scholars to engage, examine, retrieve, and cultivate other ways of thinking about and being in the world that can learn from alternative points of departure to the hegemonic <coughs> knowledge of empire. The central aim must be to reject the assumed ways in which global humanity has intellectually ordered into hierarchy, hi uh, hi a hierarchy of, of advanced and backward groups along lines produced by historic systems of colonial exploitation and dispossession. This means rethinking world politics in terms of its histories, geographies, economies, ecologies, conceptions of the human, the social, the sacred, and the mundane, and so on. This requires thinking about the kinds of research methods and models that we use, and the kinds of constituencies for and with whom the research might be produced. Well, it is difficult, luckily we as scholars uh, do not have to start from scratch once we accept the, uh, the need to think. Otherwise, the world is full of already <coughs> existing possibilities. And so I thank Mira for bringing that to our attention, and I look forward to um, hearing your talk about the university. Thank you. to read a land acknowledgement statement, which is not a very common practice, I think, here in the United States. Uh, it's much more common in Australia and Canada when thinking about um, the geographies of settler colonialism. Uh, and so I took the opportunity to educate myself a little bit about the Connecticut area, um, which actually, the word Connecticut comes from a Mohegan word, uh, Kinitikut. Kin I'm not saying that correctly, obviously. Um, but that gave its, its name to the local area and to many of the features here. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the territory of Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, uh, Susquehannock, Golden Hill, Pogusset, and Nipmuc peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Now, the act of reading a land acknowledgement um, not only helps to start strip back those layers that we take for granted, it's a very beautiful you know, New England campus and the fall and all of this classic things, but beneath all of those buildings and all of this very nice landscaping, there is another history there, right? There were peoples here, there were histories, <coughs> and that's which the land was used previously. And part of decolonizing is recovering that memory as well as the present kind of uh, environment. The third little thing I want to say is just that um, it's my late father's birthday today, and so it's a very nice uh, date in which to give this talk and to dedicate it to him. All right, so now we've got the preliminaries out of the way, let's get to business. Uh, so decolonizing the university. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been involved as increasingly a sort of activist as well as scholar around this particular struggle, not, not exactly by design, but sort of um, by accident. And so what I want to talk to you about today is something about what I think is going on in the world, what the global movement is to decolonize the university, what is meant by that, <coughs> why it's happening now, who's doing things, what are they doing, and what this might mean for the broader kind of systems in which we live. I'll also say a few words about social movements and how they work and how this particular movement is working within those parameters, and finally look out to some of the broader <coughs> implications for society. But let's start with that first question. Um, sorry. <coughs> let's start with that first question, what is going on? So I want to start us um, in South Africa. So this is the University of Cape Town. Uh, in 2015 there was a massive student protest um, focused around the statue of Cecil Rhodes. Does anyone know who Cecil Rhodes was? Yeah, okay, good. A number of you do. Um, is a major figure in the British uh, colonial apparatus, 
um, particularly pioneering um, land appropriation for mining things like gold and diamonds, uh, invested in the company De Beers and so on, um, but involved as well in a lot of cruelties and exploitations towards African people, was quite indifferent to their murder and killing as part of this process. And so until 2015, you know, 20 years after the fall of apartheid, a statue commemorating Cecil Rhodes remained in the University of Cape Town and a number of his legacies kind of dot the landscape. So the students in South Africa started agitating around the statue, but this led to a much bigger deconstruction of what they thought was wrong with the universities that they were working and living in. Now, South Africa is obviously a majority uh, black African country, but of course the universities um, remained bastions of whiteness, in, particularly in terms of the staffing profile, but also in terms of the orientation of the subjects that were being taught and the ways in which the education was unfolding. So there's been a huge upheaval within South African higher education in terms of demands for uh, more diverse and more African-oriented um, curricula, uh, more African staff uh, of black African origin, um, environments crucially in which students of all backgrounds can have access. So the Roads Must Fall campaign quickly became a Fees Must Fall campaign and became about free access to education. So that's one snapshot, and that's in some ways the spark for the most recent kind of uprisings. Of course, in uh, Latin America, you won't be able to read this text, and that's not really necessary. Um, in Latin America, the idea of decolonizing the university and decolonizing institutions has been around maybe a little bit longer and kind of gathering momentum over the last 20 years, especially as part of the decolonial critique within the academy. So you have people like, um, uh, Colombian scholar Santiago Castro Gomez, writing about decolonizing the university as a way of deconstructing the coloniality of knowledge, right? Specifically, the ways of thinking that organize the world around categories and ideas that have been inherited from colonial times. Over in London, this is a student society that became incredibly popular um, at around the same time, 2015-16, uh, started at my institution, SOAS, uh, which really opened up a massive kind of wave of activism and debates around what it meant to argue that the university was a sort of colonial entity, um, and it was accompanied by uh, groups in UCL called things like Why Isn't My Professor Black or Why Is My uh, Curriculum White? Um, more recently, we've had activism at Goldsmiths. Students have launched a sort of 130-day occupation that eventually uh, ended up with the institution uh, agreeing to a set of demands around uh, having more diverse curricula, insourcing staff, um, race awareness training, these kinds of measures. It's not just in the smaller institutions, larger institutions are now starting to think um, and act along the language of reparations. And this is a huge kind of step compared to say about five years ago particularly institutions that have legacies associated with um, uh, profits from slavery, have had to look at their own endowments, their own legacies, and ask who those legacies are profiting and whether reparations are an appropriate response. That's not just a conversation uh, being had in the UK, but also in, in the US, and some of you will have heard about uh, what's been happening at Georgetown. And this has just gathered a lot of wide-ranging um, political interest. I'm putting up this headline, The Duchess of Sussex wants to decolonize the curriculum in new political intervention. Not because she does. I mean, that's, uh, this, this story kind of <laughs> generated out of a... Anyway, I'll explain that when I talk to it later. There was a meeting. She's the new patron of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. At a meeting, we presented some of these ideas to her, and she was heard making vaguely approving noises, which then exploded in the press into this massive story, in such that places such as Harper's Bazaar, Forbes, and so on, were covering the decolonizing the curriculum movement, and she's received a lot of stick for it. So this gives you just a snapshot of the kind of wave that is kind of happening around the world, and some of the interest in it. Like, I never thought that something I did would be covered in Harper's Bazaar, and yet... <coughs> This has happened, so we're in a strange place. Before I progress into thinking about the sort of social movement, though, I wanted to clarify what I think the movement means by decolonizing the university, and certainly where some of our discussions have been in, in SOAS. Uh, so I wanted to take us back to some of the kind of common assumptions or principles. 
Now, because of the nature of this exposition, I'm going to have to go through some of these without explaining them at full length, but I'd be very happy to expand on some of these in the, in the Q&A. Okay, so the assumption number one is that universities, like many modern institutions, developed principally in an era of Western colonial expansion and supremacist thinking, right? So the golden age for when universities organized themselves, became mass massively expanded institutions. We're looking at essentially the 19th and um, early 20th centuries. And at this time, particular kinds of thinking, particular kinds of attitudes were very dominant. Now, in the meantime, of course, these practices and beliefs have been supposedly discredited, right? So we consider the present day to be one in which anti-racism or non-racism is the norm, and uh, anti-imperialism, at least at the level of international law, is very much uh, part of the lexicon, right? Nations have the right to self-determination, people should be treated equally, etc., etc. So even though at a broad scale and a historical scale, we can say these practices and beliefs have been supposedly discredited, the argument, at least within the universities, is that there are structural <coughs> continuities embedded in contemporary institutions, right? And so the things that people point to, sorry, let's try to <laughs> spit into this microphone too much. Um, look at the colonial relations embedded in a wide range of things that we do. So they include curriculum in terms of whose perspectives are included, what ideas are included, where we think the authoritative knowledge comes from teaching practices in terms of um, how students are expected to learn, what the model student looks like, how we treat students from minoritized backgrounds, and there's a lot of research on this. Research practices in terms of consent, in terms of engagement with the so-called subjects of research. Uh, academic hierarchies and faculty profiles, who is protected, who is vulnerable, who is precarious. Uh, the treatment of minoritized groups of students and staff, how do institutions deal with, for example, uh, campus racism when it's experienced by their members. Um, profit from exploitation and appropriation. Where do universities invest? Where does their money go? Where do the profits kind of circulate through, etc. So one of the final kind of uh, pillars of the argument is really that the diversity policies that we've had so far have not been effective at producing the kind of transformation that people desire. So even though, of course, there have been massive steps in this country in terms of desegregating um, uh, public spaces and um, in terms of affirmative action, which we don't have in my country, by the way, nonetheless, these have not been effective at producing the kinds of transformation which an anti-racist or decolonized society might want to see. So from this set of principles comes two outcomes, right, two conclusions. The first one is that actually there are serious intellectual and academic limitations that come from this. That is to say that prioritizing a particular set of knowers and knowledge um, that we don't actually see all of the things that there are to see. We have these kind of blinkers on uh, because of the way that we're taught. And second, that these continue to produce some kind of profound injustices within institutions, particularly for um, minoritized students and staff, indigenous students and staff, um, students who cannot access universities for various reasons. So, with those assumptions and those conclusions, what decolonizing the university therefore does is uh, attempt to transform institutions, right? So it's saying we need to rethink how the institutions work, and to make them made to the measure of humanity. That's a phrase called by, um, it's a phrase by Césaire when he's talking about um, colonialism. And he's saying, European colonialism has talked about its own humanism for a long time, but its humanism is very exclusionary and hierarchical. If you make it, if you make the world made to the measure of humanity, all humanity, then the world looks different. So what does this mean? Uh, now here are some of the, uh, demands or principles that movements have put forward. First, they've demanded that universities acknowledge historical injustices of various kinds, um, whether it is uh, a particular role in, um, uh, let's say, slavery, for example, or a particular role in um, the discrimination of, uh, against um, students. That's something that they want specifically acknowledged and to pair that with a commitment to anti-racism and reparative action, however that's understood in this wider debate about reparations. 
On the intellectual side, um, there's a call for exposing and interrogating the limitations of what we've studied or learned as being so-called universal. If we study political theory just as kind of the grand story of humanity, whose political theory are we studying, right? What is that tradition? It's about rethinking pedagogical practice around student empowerment. So it's all very well to study very kind of critical uh, global syllabuses, um, but if you're not actually teaching students in a way that makes them feel empowered vis-a-vis -vis the material in the classroom, uh, then you're kind of in some ways reproducing some of those hierarchies. Within universities, there's been calls for real accountability, particularly around um, uh, student complaints and um, complaints of racism that don't really seem to go anywhere, and for representation in terms of diversity and senior uh, leadership. There's a call for relating universities to their surrounding publics and communities, um, to think of the university not just as an island kind of sealed off from the communities that it works in, but actually kind of accountable to them and participating with them in the, in the local area. And finally, there's a set of demands around access to education and what that means. Um, and there are all kinds of disputes within the movement about what any of these things might concretely entail and which one should be the priority and so on and so forth. So finally, just on this section about what is going on, um, I wanted to point to a couple of underlying issues that are also there as part of the discussion in the movement. I'll talk about this one briefly. Some of you will be familiar with the work of the Latin American School um, on modernity coloniality. And this is a sort of deep structural trans-historical argument that modernity itself is kind of a colonial construction. Um, and as a colonial construction, it produces these hierarchical binaries between the West and the other, and it gives them different roles and entitlements and obligations and properties and so on. So that's a sort of underpinning uh, issue or problem that we might want to uh, think about. In the context of the modern university, one might argue that those binaries define what we call global excellence in the contemporary age, right? Universities are all involved in these ranking exercises, they're all involved in competition. How do we know which universities are the best? It tends to be which universities best approximate a particular model of what a university should do and what it should look like. A second underlying issue, and I think this is in some sense the sort of the deep issue in all of this is the problem of what we might think of as epistemological standpoint. Now those of you that have been subjected, and I use that word advisedly, to the book, um, will have read a bit about this in, in uh, chapter four. But it's a simple proposition that leads to a big problem, right? The simple proposition is that your socio-political location is critical to how you encounter reality, right? So if you're embodied as a man, you'll go in the world in a certain kind of way. If you're embodied as a woman, you'll experience other kinds of things. So things like, um, let's say, the everyday sexism movement or the Me Too movement have sought to expose what the everyday realities are of gender and sexualization in, uh, in public. And that's, you know, that seems pretty obvious um, as a point. The problem is that when this is connected with power or privilege, it means that many of the problems that less powerful people encounter are generally invisible to more powerful people, right? Because if you don't encounter them as part of your daily reality, you may be inclined to think that they don't exist, or you don't perceive them in the same way. And we see this throughout all kinds of conflicts in society, where one group says that this thing is a problem, another group thinks it's not a problem, or ignores it, or doesn't see what's going on. But when we talk about decolonizing the university, if only certain groups have been historically represented in the university, what is it that they're not seeing, right? What is it that they're not analyzing? What is it that's invisible to them? The problem is we don't know what we don't know, right? There are all kinds of languages, all kinds of histories, all kinds of ways of thinking, even internal, let's say, to the West. One does not have to be an expert in Chinese philosophy to think about suppressed knowledges. Um, which we are only now starting to have the capacity to unpack and to bring into dialogue with the, um, with the common kind of syllabus or the common uh, ways of thinking. Now this limits our understanding and itself can be understood as a source of what we might call epistemic injustice. Um, so the exclusion of people via the exclusion 
technologies. Okay, so that's kind of the heavier theory stuff and um, what is some of the issues underlying uh, the decolonizing movement. I want to shift now to thinking about um, the movement itself and think about this moment. Why is this happening now? What's going on in the world that means this kind of thing is happening? So the first set of things is that it's a generational shift, right? So my parents' generation certainly were not up to much of this kind of stuff. Some people were, and there were movements um, for um, uh, racial equality and this kind of thing, which were very important. But the generation that you've got now, let's say in South Africa, they're called the born free generation, Many, most of them were born after apartheid, um, are demanding more from the system than their parents were, right? And they're asking for more. Ditto in the UK, you have a huge number in the ex ex a huge expansion in student numbers, um, particularly from minorities, minoritized communities who are looking at their own heritages uh, critically. In the US, the generation now is are the small children, maybe the grandchildren of the struggles from the civil rights era, uh, and that has hugely increased, particularly African American presence in universities uh, from the 1960s onwards. So you've got a generational shift that's happened, and um, your generation specifically, that are looking at things differently, and not just this question of race, but question of the environment, and so on. So. Second, we've had a few decades of where liberal policy, and I use this term in, an, in inverted commas, has failed to reduce inequalities. Now what we see is a lot of data that shows that even if, you know, um, affirmative uh, admission standards are produced, or even if there are public commitments to equality and diversity, but the outcomes for students, the outcomes for <coughs> staff are different, right, depending on your background. The third factor as to why this is all happening now is the renewed strength of social movements outside the university. Um, just to name a few, let's say things like the Dakota Pipeline protest, indigenous protests around land and extractive pollution, you've got campaigns like Black Lives Matter, putting these things very much front and center in the agenda. And there is a growing connectivity between and an assertiveness of these movements, right? So these movements are literally feeding off each other. You have people in uh, Missouri telling people, or people in Gaza telling people in Missouri how to deal with tear gas, right? So there are these movements that are all kind of connected. However, it's not just kind of lefty progressive social movements that are growing, it's also right-wing movements, right? So there's a re-emergence or emergence of alt-right, racist, nativist movements around the world that seek to move away from the liberal consensus around um, inclusion or uh, cultural tolerance and so on. We see in the UK even, and I think in the US as well, attempts to rehabilitate eugenics or supremacist thinking. <coughs> I've been following a Twitter spat <coughs> online today um, where a prominent academic is retweeting some fairly eugenicist things about black people and computer science, it's kind of blowing up. And there's a wider loss of momentum for what we might call centrist campaigns. So this is a political moment which I think we're familiar with from the news, the idea that the center has kind of fallen out of politics in many political contexts. That's not just in the UK and the US, but also if you look at places such as India, if you look at places such as Turkey, you've got increasingly divided <coughs> populations. Zooming out a little bit further, there's two more factors that I wanted to highlight. Um, first is what we might think of as the geopolitical and philosophical weakening of the West relative to the rest of the world, right? So this is something which has been a trend uh, maybe for a couple of decades. Obviously, we think about the rise of countries in the global south, the rise of China, the rise of you know, Brazil, and so on. Um, concretely, this means that lots of countries have more power and more choices about what they do, and they may not that they do in practice to live a decolonial life, but they offer the possibility of some kind of alternative. You get critiques within the West, um, particularly around theories about racial or cultural superiority, which have been very much discredited and unpicked from within, right? They've been deconstructed by the politics within the West. And then there's a wider context of the war on terror and what that has done to weaken the West globally. Right, in terms of discrediting its liberal credentials, in terms of um, reframing the West as a much more kind of militaristic uh, entity. And the final um, factor I wanted to point to 
is what we might call a neoliberal turn in education policy. And this is really about the kinds of pressures that universities are under. So universities now, in this world of rankings, in this world of competition, in this world of marketization, are becoming very risk averse and publicity conscious, right? So they're much more sensitive to public opinion than they used to be. They're very keen to celebrate diversity as a means to attract more students and therefore more fee income. So it's important for universities to present themselves as being open, at least, to the challenges that are being raised by these movements. And in some contexts, you have regulation or even target setting around things like racial inequality. So one thing which has been emerging in the UK, for example, is something called a teaching excellence framework, which is an incredibly bureaucratic um, thing. But one of the things that they may measure is the difference between the numbers of black students and white students who emerge with either a 2-1 or a first class degree. Right? And what we know from the data, this is data produced by the UK's own government, is that even when students go into universities with the same grades, they're coming out with different outcomes, right? So these are the same qualifications on leaving school. The blue line at the top represents white students. The, <laughs> the categories are kind of uh, interesting. The red line is mixed slash other. Um, the green line is Asian students, and the yellow line is black students. And in the UK, they collect this demographic information as part of the university registration. So we can very finely track, at my institution, you can even track in principle at the modular level who's getting better grades. I saw one graph at my institution which suggested that white students were receiving a sort of statistical bump over the pass mark which other students were not receiving, right? So white students were more likely to get the benefit of the doubt from their teachers than non-white students. <coughs> but this is a national trend. So even if you go into university with very high grades, as a black student, like three A's, or you know, you're actually less likely to get a first class or a two one degree than a white student who's done pretty well, much much less well, right? Say they've got the three B's. That's a huge gap academically, right? Um, but it's a massive pattern. So statistics like this, pressures like this, not just from internal movements but from externally in terms of the government, are also contributing to this moment. Okay, so. Let's think then about what, how we can analyze this movement. So what I've tried to do is think through a sort of conceptual framework that we can use to think about what's happening within universities. Um, and I speak as somebody who's been trained in a very different, you know, the environment in which I was trained as an undergraduate, a graduate student, and you know, in my high school, is very different to the environment in which I'm now working. Right? There are conversations that we have now that we would not have had 20 years ago or, or um, before. And I think what is happening is that there are different forces at work within higher education. And they're all present within all universities. And I would say even within academics as individuals and collectives, these four forces kind of work themselves out in different ways. And this is really about what vision of education they have and what vision of education drives them. So what are these four forces? Um, one which I would say is relatively um, well understood might be a conservative force within education. So a vision of education as reproducing societal knowledge and values in new generations. So education is this kind of transmission belt for society's cultural values um, and in this in this kind of vision of education, the educators themselves are the intellectual authorities, they're the gurus, they pass on their information to the students um, uh, in their charge. And that's one vision of education which has held sway at various times and places around the world. Still holds sway, I would argue, to uh, um, some extent within the contemporary university. Now this is slightly at odds with what I would call a liberal view of education, the liberal tradition of education, which sees it very much as education being about creating a free space for debate, a free space for debate and contestation. And if you look at how universities represent what they do, often they refer to this kind of activity, right? We're here to debate freely, we are here to um, challenge ideas, the best ideas are going to win because that's how science works. And so in this view of education, a liberal view of education, educators um, they be neutral facilitators, right? They introduce the students to competing points of view, 
and the students themselves decide, or you know, the intellectual argument proceeds and somebody wins. And this is, a, again, something which is very much embedded in how we think about teaching and doing things within the university. I'm not criticizing these ways of thinking about education, I'm just distinguishing them from each other. Third, there is, within universities globally, and it may be at different points in different uh, places, and certainly in the UK this is a big one, is what we might call a neoliberal understanding of education. And the, the major feature of this is that education is seen as something which is upskilling people for the knowledge economy, right? This is all about feeding employers and producing skilled graduates and producing a kind of workforce. It's also about the commodification and marketization of education. So your educators are your service providers, right? Students are consumers. They get to choose on, uh, they get to choose their institutions based on consumer preferences and uh, fees entail a kind of service relationship, right? I paid my fees so you must do X or even I deserve this kind of break. Again, it's like caricature. But this is one thing which university managements in particular are very subject to in terms of external pressures. The fourth force that I would say is also within the university, and again, has been there sort of all along, um, but associated particularly with the critical pedagogy movements of the 60s and 70s, is the idea that education is a tool for liberation, for social change, humanization for improving people or liberating them somehow from their situation. So this is associated with the work of people like Carlo Freire, Bell Hooks, and so on. So in this vision of education, educators are kind of co-producers with students, it's a mutual learning experience, um, you know, and that it should be guided by some kind of democratic principles. Now I want to say two things about these four courses. First, they all exist in every university, right? They all exist in every university. And second, that the critical kind of edge is driving a lot of the decolonizing movement. However, it's also interacting with all of these other elements, right? So sometimes student demands in the decolonizing movement are articulated as consumer demands, right? So they're like, well, I am paying my fees, so therefore I should not be subject to discrimination. It's not made as a claim for justice, but as like inadequate service, right? There's a lot of overlap, let's say, between the liberal and critical positions in which um, students are saying, we want to be free to explore our ideas, we want to be free to define you know, the terms of debate, um, and also that this will somehow be liberating, right? It may or may not be liberating, but these things are often linked. And there are elements, I won't go into each relationship with each other. But what does this mean for thinking about decolonizing the university? I would argue that this means it can be understood as a struggle for a specific vision of education, right? maybe a critical vision, maybe an emancipatory vision, but it has to both compete and collaborate with the other forces and visions that are going on in the university. Right? It, needs to it needs to navigate that terrain. It needs to, in some senses, respect that terrain understand that this is also how universities are constituted. Now some of the thinkers um, who have been thinking about these problems, essentially the problem of how to change a system from the inside, have looked at these problems um, from the point of view of decolonizing. I just wanted to read you this quote from uh, a writer under the name of L.A. Paperson, who's also known as um, Wayne Yang. Some of you may have read the piece, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. One or two? Anyway, it's quite a famous piece, but you can look at it if you want. And it's about this relationship, I think, that I just described. Within the colonizing university also exists a decolonizing education. The bits of machinery that make up a decolonizing university are driven by decolonial desires with decolonizing dreamers who are subversively part of the machinery and part machine themselves. Right? What he's speaking to in this quotation is about that ambivalent position of people within the institutions who are also part of those institutions, in some ways part of the problem, trying to fix the problem or to think differently within them. All right, which leads us to the last kind of part of the lecture, um, but how can it be done and can it be done, right? There's a lot of pessimism out there which says that this thing, the machine is too big, the structures are too powerful, change can't really happen or it's only going to be 
I am not so pessimistic, but I think we need to think through the theories of how change has ever been made in the human society, right? How, how have big things happened? How did women get the vote? How did the civil rights movement emerge? How did countries throw off colonialism? Good. The good news is that we know actually quite a lot of what makes social movements successful. Um, and these are pretty consistent patterns when you look at which have been the successful social movements over time. First, grassroots organizing, very key. You have to have a massive ground game, you have to have a good ground game, you have to have numbers. And people who are actually engaged rather than just kind of um, passively. There needs to be leadership, not just invested in one person, although we often focus historically on single individuals. Um, actually, the strength of movements is through collective and dispersed leadership. There have to be clear and specific goals defined by the wider movement. Um, this is quite important, and one thing which will prove that challenging for some of the university situations. Um, but you need to know what you want. <coughs> you can't just say, I want women's equality. You have to say, I want rights for women, I want women to be able to own property, etc., etc. You have to have a positive alternative vision of the future, right? You have to have some kind of promise. You have to have the ability to change minds in wider society. Um, all social change, all profound social change that isn't just, you know, sort of people fighting their way over, has to win over the public, has to win over the majority of people, has to become uh, part of the common sense. Unity, kind of a classic um, uh, challenge of social movements. And the ability to build broad alliances around shared goals, right? Big, large scale social change does not happen when it's, it's only a small group of people who are invested in a particular outcome. This means, in particular, developing connections with sympathetic elite parties, right? I mean, short of huge revolutions which get rid of all the elites, most large-scale social change identifies elites that it can work with and is, ha has an ability to take advantage of political opportunities, right, when they present themselves. Now, a classic example of a successful social movement is the Indian independence movement. Um, and I would argue that it, it worked in part because it did lots of those things that we were talking about. Um, Gandhi, I actually don't have much trouble with his political philosophy, although he's much celebrated for that these days. However, he was a genius at organizing. So things like the Salt March um, were great. So the Salt March was about rejecting the British imperial monopoly of the salt trade. Um, so Indians were forbidden from making their own salt, they had to import it from British salt manufacturers. And so the Salt March was about defying that law and going to the sea to make your own salt ticks lots of boxes, right? It's a mass action, so lots of people can be involved, lots of people can do it, everyone knows how to make salt. It is a clear single demand, right, to abolish the salt tax or to abolish the um, import requirement. It unifies lots of people. You get a very broad alliance of people who are up for this, right, because salt is more expensive than salt, and so on and so forth. So Gandhi actually, his skill as a political organizer is to get a few of these big headline things that lots of people agree on and to really use them to expose the wider structural situation. I would say in terms of the present movement for decolonizing the university, we're not quite there. These are some of the issues that I think we're facing. Um, first, there's a range of different demands across institutions, right? There's not necessarily a clear focus as to what people want to do. And there's different constitu constituencies with different priorities and objectives. So you could have more conservative goals, say, okay, I just want a few more black professors, or I want to change a couple of readings. Two much more radical goals, like we want this university to give up this land back to the indigenous peoples and to recognize the sovereignty and so on, right? Very different kinds of goals that have different kinds of implications for universities. People have been really focused on problems, I think, rather than alternatives, and this is a big kind of tenor of the debate, I would say. And that's an issue, because you can talk about problems quite a lot, but unless you can say, hey, here's a way of doing this differently, or here's an alternative, it's not going to be very useful. It's not, I mean, it's not necessarily been great at changing people's minds, in part because a lot of the debate has been about shaming and confrontation rather than kind of calling people in, I would say. 
And so this tends to trigger a lot of emotions like you know, guilt and resentment and so on, and can shut people down rather than invite them in. Because of the nature of the issues and maybe particularly people in older generations, there's a repeated sense that these things have gone on and on and not much has happened, so there's a certain pessimism in the movement. The corollary, the weird corollary of that is that there's also sometimes a fear of a success or co-optation. I've certainly seen this in a number of the student movements in which the institutions have gone, okay, yeah, we agree to your demands. And then they say, well, you've co-opted us, right? So there's some kind of weird fear of actually winning the argument. And finally, um, there's a whole set of questions about whether we can even talk about decolonizing the university. All right, so I'm just going to... I'm actually going to, because I think, how much time have we got? Is it two minutes? <laughs> 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 there might be a right. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I'm actually going to skip over, <clears throat> actually, no, I'm going to talk about a last couple of things. <coughs> I'll just leave some of the backlash questions for the end. Um, I think there are some strengths which the movement can build on and which kind of represent some promise of those shared action. And the first thing is I think that there is increasingly a shared framing and analysis as a basis for action. And the connectivity of the movement in terms of social media, in terms of Twitter and so on, um, helps with that, right? It helps people identify things and uh, share ideas. And it's backed up, I think, by a largely academic or what we might call a scientific cons consensus around many of these key phenomena. Right? So if you look at the studies around student performance, if you look at studies around racism, if you look at studies around curriculum, there is a clear consensus around who's included and who's excluded, who's disadvantaged and why and so on. Right? So this is kind of backed up. There's now, of course, better data, depending on which context you're in, about exclusion and discrimination, which is data collected by official sources, which again, we didn't necessarily have. There's possibilities for learning transnationally. Um, certainly our group has been in touch with groups in Australia, in South Africa, in Canada, looking at the kinds of work that we've been doing together and been sharing ideas about what that is. And there are still some strong grassroots movements. So it's not been totally, I think, co-opted into uh, the elite. Part of the strength of these grass move movements has been the creation of alternative spaces for learning, right? So it's not just about what you can do in your own modules, but actually what you can do for yourselves. Like where are your reading groups? Who are you learning from? What are you um, setting up? And these can be connected to the universities and the resources they offer, but it can also be separate from that. And some universities are taking action, albeit in limited areas. I just wanted to share with you some of the stuff that my university has been doing since um, the student mobilization started, say, three or four years ago. Um, and this is some of the work that I've been um, involved in. So the first thing we've got is a working group, which doesn't sound very fancy, but it's quite, it's quite good. Um, it's funded centrally by the university's administration. Um, some of my time, some of my work time is funded to do this work, and it reports to different academic committees, including the sort of powerful ones, right? The academic board, the senate, the board of trustees, which is the governors that you know, oversee the university and so on. So we've gone from being a sort of outside shouting in type of group to now being part of the institutional infrastructure. This has come alongside an official institutional commitment to the broad aims of decolonization. And that statement, which we've got on our website, includes questions of research, teaching, public engagement, and so on, right? So the university is committed, it's made commitments to doing this stuff. One of the things that the working group has done is produce a short document which we call a learning and teaching toolkit, which talks about what it actually means concretely to decolonize one's curriculum or one's module or program, and also what it means to try and adopt a decolonial approach in teaching. This may be old hat in the US, but it's not necessarily in the UK. A mandatory inclusive teaching training for all permanent faculty. So that is incorporating anti-racist pedagogies, um, it's incorporating stuff around disability, it's incorporating stuff around assessment. 
So faculty have historically received very little training in how to actually teach you guys. I don't want to shock you. But no. <laughs> it's, it's been virtually zero. It's increasing a little bit these days. Um, so the idea that you would have to mandatorily learn, let's say, how to teach disabled students in line with their needs is, 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 is actually a huge kind of uh, jump to keep for many of the faculty. Um, not that I'm being aged, but, but uh, in terms of the cultural expectations around pedagogy, these have come a very long way. Um, we're doing more work on uh, empowering and equitable research partnerships. We had a sort of event with the funders where we talked about the issues faced, particularly by partners in the global south, in accessing research funding and how the structures of funding themselves meant that the relationships that some of us talked about in class earlier, those hierarchies, who sets the agenda, are all part of research projects. And at the institution, we've kind of maintained that autonomous student movement. So it's not, we haven't done everything by any means. We're still struggling with lots of elements of what it means to decolonize an institution and whether our own institution, particularly because it was founded to support the British Empire, right? it's a school of Oriental and African studies meant to train people in the languages and cultures of Asia and Africa as part of the British kind of imperial takeover. Whether an institution like this could ever kind of be a liberating force. Yet, the ways of thinking, the sort of anti-colonial kind of drift of thinking has been part of the institution for a long time. So we have quite a supportive academic community. Right, I am gonna um, skip forward, I think, a little bit to give time for questions, because I don't wanna, um, yeah. I've also got a cool sound clip to play you, but I'm, I'll stay with that. <laughs> okay, let's just um, get through some of these things. I'll, I can talk to you about the backlash. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get to the conclusions, and I can talk about some of the other stuff as well, too. Despite all of the challenges that I think that decolonizing the university movement has, um, uh, which are moral and intellectual and political and resource and structural and all the rest of it, I'm quite optimistic, right? Because if you look at history, things change, right? They do change, and they change because people sort of make change, right? And so institutions and collectives and groups always have the power to make change. And in smaller institutions, sometimes these kinds of things are easier. And my institution Change does need to ally both intellectual power and organizational power. Having one without the other is pretty useless um, and will quickly lead to disunity or um, a sort of failure to identify goals. Or, contrary, nothing happens, right? So in, in a lot of universities, there's a lot of intellectual power behind these things, but they're not very well organized. A third concluding thought is that some things are irresolvable, right? Some conflicts require people to take a position that they may not want to confront. And the particular example that keeps coming up again and again is around racist speech on campus and whether it's protected by academic freedom, whether it constitutes a legitimate form of um, articulation, uh, or whether it constitutes hate speech and therefore should be banned. This is an ongoing debate and that Twitter storm I was talking about earlier, involved, involves some academics saying it's not racist to say that something which is obviously racist is racist. But the fact that it's not obviously racist to them is, is, is the important part of the picture, right? They're claiming it's part of normal academic inquiry, whereas others are saying, no, that's clearly racist. But, like all the movements before it, um, I do think this is a really interesting movement. It's a challenging movement. Um, and it's asking us to rethink some basic categories, like what we mean by freedom, what we mean by justice, even what we mean by democracy, right? In societies which are, which have this legacy in them, what does it mean for them to be truly democratic? What does it mean for people to all be part of a, a single community? Um, and I am, I will always be sort of optimistic about our capacity to do better than we have done uh, in the past. And I will stop there.
So Trinity is very white and very wealthy, and we sit in the middle of Hartford, which is dominated mostly by people of color, and it has a lot of wealth and equality. So I'm just wondering, like, how do we start breaking down these barriers and breaking out of this bubble that we sit in up here and getting more engaged with our community? Okay, good question. Um, do we want to take several questions at a time? Okay, all right. So I'm going to write that question down so I don't forget it. So you mentioned that uh, sort of the propelling force of uh, decolonizing uh, academics is this idea that we don't know what we don't, or we don't know what we don't know, um, but we also need specific goals um, to set and to achieve um, if we're going to keep decolonizing. I'm wondering how you balance um, our knowledge of where we should be going, or our lack of knowledge of where we should be going with those specific goals. Okay, good. All right. Well, those are three really hard questions, which I could record it. But I'll, I'll remind, remember you guys for the next round. Plus, how to connect with the local community. So I think there's different ways into this problem. So one is actually the local community is already to an extent part of the college community. That is to say that the people who work on campus in catering and security and so on are presumably drawn from the surrounding communities and are part of, um, are already part of the school community. So one step is to engage with them, ask them what they're doing, what they're about. A big part of our decolonizing has also been linked to um, insourcing workers. So they were all working for this multinational company before, but they're now employees of the institution with the same rights for, and benefits structures. So that's one angle you could go with. Um, another one might be to be in contact with the indigenous peoples of the area um, and to talk about land and the other issues. You know, what is the history of this particular land? How well is it visible or how commemorated is it? Yeah, how could you make that more visible? Um, those are two ways. A third way to be thinking about access for local community. Are there, for example, scholarships which are for people of Hartford, right? These kinds of things. Is that, a, is that a way of connecting in? Could you use these spaces in the universities to also help community organizing, right? Could you lease out your halls or your, you know, your nice facilities to enable community events to take place? So there are all kinds of ways uh, the question is about the political science curriculum. What would a decolonized one look like? So I tend to use the word decolonizing rather than decolonized because I think it's really about the ethos and the journey rather than the, the destination. Um, but that said, um, there's a few different things that we talk about in the, in the toolkit. So one is about things which are already internal slightly to the discipline. So what are the origins of the discipline and what are the connections with um, colonial and imperial structures, right? There's a great book by Robert Vitalis, um, uh, White World or the Black Power Politics, which very carefully unpicks, for example, the field of international relations, and there are some similar ones, or similar pieces with regard to political science. So that's one thing. Another thing is to try and look at writing from around the world on politics, maybe not narrowly defined as political science, but on politics that gives you different perspectives on the world. And there are traditions, certainly, in African political thought, there are traditions of writing about politics in the Middle East and so on. You can have a sort of greater geographical spread. Um, and then you can also think about political theory as occurring in different spaces and places. So you're not just having this very kind of narrow canon um, defined by a relationship with the so-called Enlightenment, but you're looking at influential thinkers from around the world. And if we think about who those influential thinkers are, we start to see some historically influential people, right? You know, who is more influential in contemporary thought? Is it Nietzsche or is it Mao, right? I mean, who are the people that have really made an impact on the world? So those are some of the directions that you could go in. Um, I think decolonizing in, has to be a contextual endeavor as well. So um, decolonizing in the US might mean a much more, in, much more integrated relationship with thinking about settler colonialism and indigeneity and so on as a sort of starting point. Actually, there's a great article on why political science hates Native Americans, which is published in PS or something. I can't remember. But anyway, 
So that's the kind of thing that you could start with to kind of build up an awareness or a sensibility. Um, and the question uh, about how we need specific goals, but we don't know what we don't know. So yeah, uh, this is a challenge. Um, so maybe one of the goals though is to make space to learn what we don't know. So a lot of, let's say research projects, expect you to already know how that research project will fit into an established literature before you are allowed to have the money and the time to go and do that project. Right? But could we make a case for having more exploratory research opportunities where not just you are defining the research question, but maybe you're co-defining it with community partners or you're co-doing it with, um, or you're learning what the research question is as you go along. In some fields, this is easier than others. Um, but making space to know and making space to learn, I think is important. Again, with education, we often preset what the outcomes of course should be before you guys even show up, right? And we're expected to do that because it's seen as good service to have all of that stuff already set up. But what if we were to co-define the learning objectives together and for you guys to decide what you wanted out of a program or a course or a module? Um, how would we manage to make that work within this structure? So some of it can be about learning, making space to learn. Okay, so next round of questions. I had, yes, you guys, I'll take all four. So I'll start with uh, you and then you, yeah. yeah. So Sorry, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned about the rising power of the global south mm -hmm. and how uh, the movement can work with them. Uh, however, I find it problematic to um, work with certain powers that are active perpetrators of uh, racial oppression. Mm -hmm. And certain communities, I want to say for the Mastic War of Rock, they, there are extensive records of um, racism and racial stratification within those uh, uh, non-Western societies. And uh, when they, I guess, contribute power, there could be strength uh, to the movement, there could be strength <laughs> attached in hopes that like, only for facilitating the investment of one group, not the others. Mm -hmm. So, how do you draw the line in that yeah. situation? Good, good question. Okay. Uh, next to you, then I'll come straight. Um, so you mentioned that one of the deepest underlying issues is the prevalence of um, privilege and mm -hmm. how it entails the invisibility of many problems. And so you kind of addressed some answers in the first question that you answered. But overall, like how would you, um, what's the most effective way to have these problems become more visible? Whether it's the popular or the general. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so in your, in your checklist about um, like successful social movements, you, you talked about engaging with power players like at the, mm -hmm. at the moment. And who do you see as the most accessible um, ones in our world today, the most accessible? people who hold power to um, engage with in terms of like, higher education, uh, engagement and advocacy. Yes. So I was very interested in that working group that you um, established mm -hmm. in uh, your organization. And I was wondering, because we give a lot of like, uh, preference to the understanding of practice of grassroots organization. Like for my first question would be, um, can there be a coalition between um, grassroots advocacy and like um, established institutions? And what is the Is for a more democratic, more humane 
well rule that has to that has to apply everywhere. And so I think building um, connections and solidarities with groups who are involved in these struggles in those contexts. So not being an outsider kind of parachuting in, but respecting that there are people on the ground already dealing with those situations and giving them support is a more useful way to think about the politics of solidarity there. Um, the point that I was making in the lecture was really about the context of, let's say, the weakening of the West as a sort of fantasy or a dream. Right? And so whilst it still holds a lot of sway in different areas, it also doesn't where it stops. Right? And so some things, consumerism, capitalism, are very popular, but other things are not so celebrated. Um, the question about privilege, um, yeah, what is the most effective way to make it visible? So I think, so I don't hold with the idea that only people who are part of the oppressed group can lead the education on the front. I think everybody can do it, right? There's plenty of information out there where people can educate themselves about what different kinds of oppression mean or what different kinds of injustices are there. Um, I did think that some of the uh, Twitter campaigns were quite useful. I thought the Everyday Sexism campaign was particularly useful in revealing the sort of hidden, hidden realities of, of social life. Um, one of the things that students have done in the Decolonizing campaign is collect testimonies um, and write reports about the experiences of students on campus, uh, which they then presented to university councils and institutions, and saying, look, this is what is going on right on your doorstep. Now, um, that's another way of educating oneself, but also educating sort of institutionally about what is, what is maybe happening. Um, and yeah, I think having effective kind of reporting mechanisms, having supportive structures within student councils and so on can be useful uh, at doing that. But again, it takes that time to, to, to do. Um, <laughs> share the resources 
with the students' movements. So when they come up with a campaign, we reach out and we say, do you want to use this? Do you want to use our platform to put this forward? Um, and to just be in touch with them and to have the conversation and to you know, meet. And so to continue to do the work of protesting sometimes, both inside and outside the institution. But I think you have to straddle those worlds. And there's roles for both. neoliberal tendency of institutions to want to project like they're addressing the problem without really taking on the roots of the problem. You know, but like a lot of people here would say that a lot of parts of the administration really like to look like they're, you know, a very progressive administration, very, you know, hands-on when we have a problem on campus, but in reality, once the headlines go away, so does the attention. Um, and so I was kind of wondering how you think we press past something like that to a situation where even your institution is at where they're really dedicating money and you know uh, faculty attention to the situation. Thank you. Good question. Uh, yeah. um, what do you think are the roles for students who are like from the global south or currently <coughs> in the global, like studying in those um, mm -hmm. like universities? What are what think are their role in terms of facilitating like the uh, like dialogue? I might just take those two questions and then come back to you guys if that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, again, the brain fries a little bit. Um, so, mm -hmm. how to get past those neoliberal tendencies? So, this is a very difficult <coughs> question, and I think basically, once the pressure goes, um, less happens. And I just think that that's a, it's almost a law of physics, right? <laughs> once, once the pressure goes, what's the momentum goes? It depends whether. So I think that what's happened with us is that actually a lot of the public pressure has gone and it's been converted into a working group activity. Um, so I think there is a continuity there, but it can run out of steam if people aren't kind of continuously kind of proactive. So having the working group has institutionalized some of the pressure, um, if you like, that then doesn't have to be reorganized every time. Um, so it's a kind of standing thing. Um, but you have to be very persistent, right? And you have to be willing to be unpopular. And I think weirdly, you have to, as people doing work like this, not be very ambitious for your, <laughs> for your faculty administration career, in the sense that you will be doing things which are awkward and confrontational and which won't necessarily make you part of a well-behaved person that they want to be the dean or whatever. Um, or maybe they will if they see that you're good at organizing. Um, but yeah, I, so you re it requires a certain set of tactics and techniques, but basically there's no substitute for actual pressure. Uh, in terms of the roles for students from the Global South, um, this is a good question, and not which one, one which I thought about too extensively on its own. Um, I think certainly in terms of the knowledge that you come into the classroom with, to just share that make that part of the education experience, either in discussion with the teachers and so on, if there's something that you know about that isn't being talked about, isn't being covered, make the suggestions. Like, we don't know everything. We're often grateful for a view or a case study that we haven't really kind of thought about. Um, in terms of organizing, I think also discussing like your experience and your perceptions of the subject area coming from where you come from. So, um, <coughs> you know, I've taught students from uh, Rwanda in a, in a class on conflict and peace studies, and like, them being able to talk about what it's like to be a Rwandan in post-conflict Rwanda is an incredibly valuable thing. That said, a lot of international students also don't want to be pigeonholed for being that guy from China or whatever, and, you know, being asked to speak for China or worse than the country that they're not from, but the teacher thinks that they're from, um, which has also happened. So, yeah, I think there's definitely an educational role, there's definitely an informative role, and there's also there's a kind of um, supported role, and I think it's one of those things. So I am a home, home uh, I'm a British person working at British University, um, and 
There are so many things about being an international student or an international staff member that just don't really occur to me, like the difficulties of getting visas and the harassment that people face and the costs that people face and so on. It's something which is an everyday reality for a lot of my colleagues, students, which we don't even think about. But then that impacts things like whether they're active on campus in various issues, right? Can they go on strike is a question that they're asking in the UK now because the universities are just ready to strike. So there's all kinds of things which are invisible to the people who themselves. <coughs> okay, I have a question there. And yeah. um, I guess through the process of decolonization, we, we still see the structure and the system of, um, of, the, of the colonial system and its legacies in place. Like, how can we ensure that the, that the legacies aren't uh, in place after, through the decolonization um, in the university years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question was about something you said at the beginning of the lecture. Um, you mentioned that a lot of uh, how you experience reality is based on your socio-political location uh, in the world. And I was wondering, do you think um, that individuals have like any kind of sway over that uh, perception of reality? And and more importantly, how does that um, fit into the decolonizing the university? Yeah. Um, so on the first question, um, we will never be free of colonial legacies, right? These are huge, powerful forces that shaped the entire world, right? And so um, the answer is not to erase or forget that history, right? That history happens, it shaped who we are, it shaped our identities, it shaped who we've married, who we've connected with, all these kinds of things. The question is, are the values that we have today working out for people in society. And so, if one of the ways in which they're not working out is that we refer to people with negative stereotypes, or we um, discriminate against people, or people have um, problematic relationships with the state and their agency, um, how, do we, how do we fix those, right? And how do we understand better what the colonial legacies are? So the problem that I come from in the UK is not so much that people really understand what happened and they're okay with it, but they don't even know what happened, right? People are unbelievably poorly educated about what the British Empire was, what it did, where it was. Um, around the commemorations of the First World War, it's only now, after a lot of activism, that people are beginning to understand that, yeah, a million and a half Indian soldiers brought to it wasn't just white soldiers from the British Empire. Uh, in the Second World War, Africans are fighting in North Africa, they're fighting in Europe, and you know, these are stories that we just haven't heard because we've literally erased them. So actually recovering an understanding of what happened and the ways in which that has entangled us and given us relations with each other, I think is, is really important for decolonization. So I think those legacies are always there. It's like how we navigate them is the issue. Um, so, so the question about um, epistemological location and do you have any say, you absolutely have say. And I strongly believe in the power of learning and communication and the ability to help people empathize with each other. Empathy is a very powerful human emotion, very powerful human force, and it has to underpin this entire thing. Right? I don't know what it's like to be uh, a Vietnamese refugee, right? but I can learn, right? I can <coughs> read, I can think, I can communicate, it's never going to be the same as like living that experience, but it's a lot better than just being totally ignorant and not knowing, you know, why they're there and seeing the newspapers refer to people in you know, very negative ways. So this is about the difference between what we unconsciously, let's say, absorb from our day-to-day -day practice in our environment and what we can consciously learn and actually try to value um, as individuals and as so we can organize our world in ways that help us learn much more about each other. So there's an experiment, not really an experiment, a project at the University of Hertfordshire, which is teaching people compassion as part of their higher education learning. So it's grading students on how well they've listened to other students and are able to reflect their points of view back to each other. 
It's asking students to adopt positions that they themselves have not experienced or don't agree with and you know, kind of work them through. Um, we can organize society to reward behavior like this much more than we do. We can organize universities to reward behavior like this much more than we do. The University of Glasgow is trying to include collegiality now as a promotion criterion because it recognized that promotions were very much based on people who had successfully individually pursued their own goals at maybe the expense of all of their colleagues. And it's asking them to show where they done something good for somebody else. Now, of course, that's not going to totally re remove an instrumentalist approach to that, but we can see it as a better step than just rewarding how much money did you win from this foundation. So, um, and if we think about magnifying that empathy principle at a global level, that would be really great. Now, this is slightly idealistic, but um, some countries do do it. And one of the things that you see when countries in the global south connect with each other is some attempt to sort of empathize with each other's positionality in ways which are, which are sometimes unexpected. Should we end there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much.